Welcome everybody to, the, to today's Vision Energy webinar called WIM 24-7. My name is Matt Barber with Marcom Communications and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Just some quick housekeeping. Your microphone isn't broken. All attendees are on mute to make sure that everybody can hear the presenter clearly. You can use the questions panel on your toolbar to type in questions at any time during today's presentation. We'll answer relevant questions as we go through the presentation and we'll hold a short Q&A at the end of the webinar. And then we are recording and we'll send out a link to all registrants after the end of the session. So in the past year, we've had quite a few interesting sessions. Um, so please go to the Vision Energy website to view all previous webinars. In particular, if you have technology questions, watch Flow Battery 101. It's our most popular session and was presented by Vision CEO and CTO, John Moore. Today's presenter is Vision Energy's Vice President of Marketing, Mike Renault. Mike has over 15 years of experience with businesses focused on deploying clean tech technology with companies such as GE, Trina Solar, Moventus, and now Vision Energy. Mike, take it away. Thanks a lot, Matt, and, and thanks everybody on the phone uh, for joining me for the next installation of the, the Vision webinar series. Um, you know, I've been working with customers and IPPs and utilities for a couple of years now on innovative hybrid uh, structures for uh, wind plus storage, and I plan to structure this webinar a little differently than the past. In the past, we have uh, kicked it off with an overview of the vision battery and some key highlights of our value proposition. But I, I think that's pretty well understood, especially by today's audience. And uh, if, you, if you'd like more technical deep dive into Vision's battery, uh, we can follow up and do that either one-on-one -on -one or you can use some of our online resources for discovery. I wanted to kick it off with a case study, um, sort of imagining the future, uh, because I think this is where uh, the industry is going not just in North America, but in other key uh, wind-based territories. And then get into uh, a deeper comparison of uh, vision versus the leading competitor, and then take questions. And please feel free to submit questions along the way. Uh, we look forward to hearing them. For the last 150 years, the most cost-effective form of fuel has come from either natural gas or coal. And we're entering a period, um, and it's regional, depending on when it's happening, where the lowest cost fuel is no longer coming from the ground, it's coming from the sky, right? Uh, either wind or solar, depending on where you are. That wind or solar um, doesn't always uh, do two things. It doesn't always uh, come on when you need it, right? It's got some baggage. It's not dispatchable. And it's not always located as an energy resource um, in close proximity to demand. And so what we're going to focus on today is um, the ways in which wind and uh, storage can work together to both alleviate dispatchability as well as uh, get wind to market, right, in an easier way. This is a pretty popular graph showing the transition point between wind and solar and coal. And this is absent of tax credits uh, of any kind. And based on uh, capacity factor improvements and overall capex improvements and reductions in operations and maintenance cost um, and independent from any cost of carbon, you know, we're, we're in the midst, depending on where you live, of this type of transition. Now, most of the articles I read about utility scale storage talk about this gap. It, talk, it talks about how wind and solar are getting cheaper, coal's flat, and there's a gap. And therefore, even though the battery is basically a boat anchor to the overall project economics, there's going to be enough headroom between the raw cost of kilowatt hours coming out of these non-dispatchable utility scale renewables and the market setting price that's required to enable a coal plant to get a decent rate of return. And this gap is going to enable uh, projects to afford the additional CapEx to have storage. Well, I kind of want to flip that around today and talk about these stars because 
we frankly think that provided markets continue to evolve, power and electricity markets continue to evolve how we think they will, the actual services and values that utility scale storage can combine when bundled with hybrid utility scale wind or solar systems, if they're compensated properly like, like they are in the example we're about to show, will enable these projects to survive at overall PPA rates that are below the PPA rates that they would otherwise be searching for as a standalone wind or solar plant. So let's jump into it. Let's look at utility scale, wind, and storage. And for our example, I decided to uh, rewind the clock 10 years back to the time when I was the, the, in charge of developing utility scale wind farms uh, for GE right after we had acquired Enron Wind and we had uh, 130 different development assets under management and we were looking for more land and we were always looking for uh, three things, right? We were looking for high wind speed, low population density because nobody wanted to look at it and good access to transmission. And, you know, for the last 15 years, everybody's always said that, you know, uh, Wyoming is the Saudi Arabia of wind, and it is. Look at the U.S. map, right? Look at population density. Look at the wind speeds. You know, dig in there. I'm going to be using 46% capacity factor throughout this analysis, but frankly, people I've been talking to with new wind turbine technology suggest that that's overly conservative and 55 high 50s is possible at ideal wind sites in Wyoming. Additionally, we're going to be talking about a transmission line that's received a lot of press that is, I think, rounding third base in terms of being built. But I think it's a model for what we're going to see either in large utility scale solar or large utility scale wind, both in North America and internationally, as uh, these resources continue to be the cheapest. But as I said in the kickoff, they're not located geographically close to uh, the, uh, the, the areas of highest demand, right? I mean, look at the wind map, you know, understand where the cities are, and you've got some challenges. Look at the solar map, and it's, it's quite frankly even worse, not just in the U.S., but across Europe, Asia, and Latin America. This TransWest Express, it's a $3 billion project. It's roughly 3 gigawatts peak capacity. At 46% capacity factor, that's 12 terawatt hours. The transmission cost, as published by AWEA and sourced on a couple different sites, is around three cents a kilowatt hour, right? So if you think about the delivered cost to Cal ISO, wheeled through Vegas for this WEC based system, right? It's about three cents a kilowatt hour on top of the energy production price, right? And so that's the delivered price, not just the price at the point of interconnect to get on the grid. Right. So we're going to be talking today about how wind and storage impacts both the project economics and the transmission distribution economics. Imagine 2019. It's not too hard to imagine. Uh, we're in Wyoming. Here are the CapEx numbers for the wind system and the vision system. Uh, $400 a kilowatt hour. So it's anywhere from a 10, 20, 30 megawatt system, four hours. Uh, you know, the... The, the, the math that we're going to look at is we're going to reverse solve for the PPA rate required to hit a 7% on levered IRR, right? We're going to be looking at the impact of modeling the cash flows from five to seven new services that the battery hybrid plant can deliver uh, to the project owner under various ownership situations um, and scenarios. Basically burdening the wind project. Oh, is there a question? Yeah, sorry, Mike. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, there was a question I wanted to get to before you moved on. Um, yeah. Do these economics represent the total cost, or is this just a cost for the hardware? No, that's that's a good question, Matt, um, and whoever it came from. So these are meant to represent the all-in turnkey capital cost uh, expectations. Now, the dollar ten for wind, you know, the margin on error of that is something we could debate and. Frankly, if anybody wants to talk about these projects um, after this webinar, just email me, and I'd be happy to open up the Excel sheet, uh, share it with you, uh, treat it as shareware, and uh, go through the model 
Uh, so you can look at our assumptions and you can plug in your own for your own projects. So if you've been on a vision webinar before, you've seen this uh, chart. Basically, when you, if and when you do want to see our model for all interim key capital costs, it includes basically this massive menu of potential expenses. Some scale with power, some scale with energy. Uh, some are fixed costs, some are variable. Uh, we've, we've been uh, maturing this model for a little over four years, and it continues to get better and sharper every month. Let's talk about revenue, right? Let's, let's take a good look at the sources of value for this hybrid system in Wyoming, right? Um, and I'd like to break it down into three potential buckets. One is performance and grid integration, so things like ramp control, bulk energy shifting, and T&D utilization improvement. The others are savings uh, to the wind farm owner, curtailment elimination, uh, the elimination of AGC expenses, uh, lower interconnection and grid upgrade fees, um, because you can help manage the overall size of the required interconnect. And then let's take a look at income, which are mostly ancillary services and arbitrage, right? So reserve services, voltage and freak reg, capacity, peaking market participation, and then wholesale LMP arbitrage, right? All of these value streams um, are potentially possible from a utility scale hybrid storage and wind facility. Now, depending upon the ISO that you're in, uh, depending upon um, the maturity of that territory, some of these are available, some are not. The value of some are higher than others in various territories, and we'd be happy to work with you on any project, and we plan to go deeper into the regional differences a little bit later in this presentation. You might be asking yourself, what is an E and what is a P and why are those there, right? We'll talk about this a lot later when we talk about lithium ion versus vision systems. There are some battery services that are um, long duration in nature, really where the battery charges and uh, it captures a lot of energy and then it discharges a lot of energy. We call those energy services. On the other hand of the spectrum, you have short, high frequency, shorter duration, high power services where, you know, the battery needs to be able to drive that power for two, three, four hours. We call those power services. It's really important uh, to classify these types of service to understand how different types of batteries are able to perform them over the complete state of charge of the battery. And the flow battery from Vision is very different from a lithium ion system, and we'll talk about that quite a bit later. So what are these things worth? On this slide, sorry, on the, on the previous slide, um, how does storage eliminate curtailment? All right, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but Think about a, a wind farm, you know, operating um, anywhere, right? And it has blades, right? And the blades have pitch motors. And, you know, free of any curtailment signal from a utility, uh, the blades are optimizing the pitch motors to maximize AEP and capacity factor. And 100% of those kilowatt hours are going on the grid. Uh, what's happening, and we'll, we'll look at the regional differences, both in North America and in some international markets, is um, due to grid integration issues, the uh, utilities are coming back to the wind farms and saying, you know, we can't take all of your power over the next hour. Can you please set your max output at, you know, 90% of your overall plant? And uh, based on the PPAs and the negotiated offtake agreements, uh, the wind farms have to comply. So then they, they'll feather their blades and dump that power, right? And essentially lose the opportunity to generate that power. With a storage system, the battery can continue to generate that power and capture it in the battery. I'm sorry, the wind farm continue to generate the power and capture it in the battery, and then discharge it after the curtailment period and get paid for that revenue stream. Although that sounds interesting, as we look at later, that's a very small piece to the overall revenue pie for a hybrid system. So I got together with a bunch of power system experts and we looked at this Wyoming project, and we looked at the fact that uh, the vision system would cycle across the complete SOC and two cycles a day, and the fact that, you know, on the new line, the, uh, the, the wind farms will be able to 
participate in CalISO services. And so we're looking at what I would call a co-located IPP-owned power project where, you know, a large IPP like, I don't know, NextEra would own this project um, and they would participate and dispatch through the transmission line all the way into the CalISO markets. And, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about these revenue streams. And so we attempted to model them from an average high and a low, and we wanted to publish what we believe are their standard deviations. And then we wanted to, because it's typical even with wind resources, model things at what's called P95, P90, P50. And so for those of you who, you know, don't have either a statistical background or aren't used to looking at wind farms, you know, when something is P90, the P90 revenue for these combined services is $178 per kilowatt per year. What that means, stochastically, is that on any given year, there's a 90% chance that the project will generate more revenue than $178 per kilowatt hours. Now, $480 per kilowatt per year is the expected average. So there's a chance, an equal chance it could be higher, an equal chance it could be lower, right? And frankly, every wind farm in any zip code is going to have different numbers, different expectations, whether it's LMP pricing, um, the different revenue streams, and the exact nodal pricing for these various services. So we looked at the CapEx, we looked at the revenue streams, we know the OpEx, and here's the summary of the outputs, right? So. Uh, this is a sensitivity analysis where we're reverse solving for 7% unlevered IRR and asking the model what PPA rate does the project need with various levels of revenue with and without the PTC or the ITC. So if you just built a wind plant right now, standalone, and um, it had no battery in Wyoming, my model with all of its errors suggests that it's 3.1 cents a kilowatt hour. Then, if you slap on the ITC, because the wind capex is, uh, uh, you know, tends to drive these models towards the ITC, not the PTC. I'm sorry, the battery capex when added to the uh, the wind capex, it drives you towards the ITC, not the PTC. And you start to increase the size of the battery from zero to 10 to 20 to meg to 30 megawatts up against a 100 megawatt wind farm you start to see that the PPA rate increases with the larger battery, right? It goes from 2.1 to 2.3 to 2.6 cents. That's because there's no ancillary service revenue. Then if you layer in the most conservative revenues, the P90 revenues, that those numbers drop, right? From 1.7 to 1.5 to 1.3. So what's happening here? Basically the battery through its participation in ancillary services is paying for itself. It's at the same PPA rate and enabling a higher IRR or at the same IRR enabling a lower PPA rate, right? So it, it's accretive to project returns in this scenario. In this scenario, we're not looking at um, uh, t and uh, uh, savings, you know, essentially looking at the transmission line and putting more power in the transmission line, but We'll do that in the next step because it's important to look at the delivered cost of energy. And, you know, this is in the IPP-owned co-located wind plus storage scenario. And in a few slides, we'll start looking at other scenarios. So, you know, the P90 is interesting. The P50 is pretty fascinating, right? So if you compare the 2.1 cents per kilowatt hour required with the ITC and no ancillary service revenue to the 1 cent per kilowatt hour at P50, you're basically looking at right about a two cent per kilowatt hour reduction in PPA rate required by the project uh, just based on incremental ancillary service revenue. So that's, that's the plant income and plant savings model, right? So let's take a look at the bigger picture, right? Because um, as we've talked about, the Saudi Arabia of wind, right, the, the, the Wyoming, um, southeastern portion of Wyoming that can pipe into, into, and through the WEC into Cal ISO. 
they're planning on building a um, three gigawatt transmission line to support roughly three gigawatts of wind at a delivered TND cost of roughly three cents a kilowatt hour, 2.9 per my slide. Now, if you take a, a slightly different look at that and you say, well, how could we maximize the value of that infrastructure um, to the utility, to our state, um, towards hitting um, environmental goals, right? The, the solution, and this is first order, and you know, I'm sure there's going to be debate that we would propose is let's look at putting 4.3 gigawatts of wind out there with 1.3 gigawatts of storage so that the peak capacity never goes above 3 gigawatts. And at the same capacity factor, delivering 43% more megawatt hours and slashing the uh, delivery cost for T&D by up to 43%. And just looking at the 2.9 cents per kilowatt hour versus 1.6, that's an over 1 cent per kilowatt hour reduction in overall delivered costs, which when combined with the 2 cents from the previous slide gets me to the headline here that the storage system can deliver can reduce delivered costs to markets that need the power by over three cents a kilowatt hour. Now, this is where things get a little complicated and potentially interesting because it's important to think about who gets the benefit and how our power market structured. And so I want to introduce two terms. One is called co-location, the other one is called nodal. Right, so looking at the diagrams on the left, right, you've got three wind farms and you've co-located the battery. And everything that I've been talking about so far contemplates co-location in um, a CalISO non-generating resource IPP model. So that's the first column here of my table, right, where we've got the grid performance benefits, the wind plant savings, the battery income, and I've layered on one more, which is the federal incentives, the ITC or the PTC, whichever you prefer. The other approach would be nodal, right? Because there's big debates, you know. So, so where do we place the storage? Do we put it on the farms? Do we put it on the grid? Um, and, and frankly, that's going to vary depending upon the ISO, the state, the country, and the regional markets. But just taking a look at our example, you know, Wyoming and thinking through these value streams. And when you do the co-location CalISO non-generating resource IPP model, as we've just discussed, all of these potential sources of value are available. And so is the ITC or the PTC because you're charging the battery using the renewable energy. Going to a nodal-based system. Yeah. Sorry. Mike, just a quick question uh, that I thought uh, kind of related to this. Um, but would adding energy storage uh, at the wind farm impact the permitting or commissioning timeline? Sure, sure. So um, it will uh, require specific permitting. We'll talk a little bit later about the differences in permitting different energy storage technologies, right? Because, you know, Vision System um, has some very unique uh, differences when compared to lithium ion from safety, uh, toxicity, flammability, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, overall potential um, uh, permitting headaches. And uh, from commissioning, I don't think so, right? Because the assembly and integration and commissioning of a battery and a wind farm can happen in parallel with the pouring of the footings and the installation of the towers and blades. So the actual construction timeline uh, should not be impacted, and frankly, the, it's a single point of interconnect, and so actually bundling them as one solution as opposed to building a uh, nodal approach that would require two interconnections is a, uh, a simpler and more streamlined uh, project execution. So as I was talking about, I'm not going to go through this eye chart in every uh, gory detail, but I'll call out some differences between the different approaches. So the nodal, the nodal rate-based transmission and distribution grid asset approach essentially suggests that it's not an IPP that owns the battery, that the um, regulated utility owns the battery, or the transmission and distribution entity owns the battery. And here, 
yeah, the, the grid performance benefits could be realized. It's possible that uh, the wind plant, uh, because of these grid performance benefits, could see less curtailment. Um, and it's highly questionable whether or not, uh, based on the current structure of our markets, whether that those batteries could actually participate on the generation side of the market, given current legislation. And we'll talk a little bit on the next slide about how that might change in the future. And you know, as we all know, if, if the battery is not charged by renewable energy, it doesn't really qualify for either the ITC or the PTC. The last column is, is also nodal, but it's IPP ownership, that's Cal ISO NGR. And you know, the the battery income opportunity is there, right? You're just building a giant battery at a node somewhere. And um, you know, the ITC and the PTC are not there. Um, wind plants nearby, likely not uh, part of your dispatch strategy unless you have a contract with one of them. Um, that could be a uh, an additional uh, relationship, but in a standalone uh, nodal battery situation in this type of market, uh, those types of uh, value streams will not be there. Then uh, grid performance benefits, it's possible. It's possible if, if the if the uh, ancillary services and capacity markets and uh, LMP pricing is uh, structured properly and the batteries are able to do their job, it's possible that these grid performance benefits could be a ride along in the IPP setting, provided the uh, battery was dispatched in such a way that it kept the grid balanced and um, essentially gave the, uh, the, uh, the, the wind farms a, 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 an opportunity to participate in the pricing structures. So we've been talking a lot about WEC and CalISO, right? And um, when I shared this deck out with, a, with you know, a, a few wind experts over the past month, a lot of folks were asking me, well, well what about outside of Cal ISO? Um, what about outside of WEC? How, how does this work? And, you know, with, as with many state and regional policies, the Western U.S. is really leading the way. Uh, and WEC is enabling non-California-based uh, renewable energy plants that are hybrid in nature to participate in these markets. ERCOT, PJM, NISO, and uh, New England are, are fast followers, right? Each of them has emerging and maturing rules around uh, these types of structures. Each of them has different market pricing, different ancillary service mixes, and so they're, they're worth exploring. And, and frankly, we've done this with a lot of customers, and we're happy to sit down and talk about your project. Um, if we think about five years out, you know, I, I think that the FERC is really pushing pushing this, right? I mean, uh, their NOPAR in last November was um, uh, really significant in terms of uh, requiring that all ISOs uh, restructure their power markets and essentially rejigger their definition of uh, generation and resource such that energy storage can participate in wholesale services and energy storage can um, be used for combinations, unique combinations of things like transmission distribution plus ancillary services. So this is coming, right? How fast it comes is, is TBD. But as I said in the future, I said in the beginning, this is sort of a look towards the future. Before we jump into the whole vision versus lithium ion piece, um, I struggled with including this slide, but I, it, it really boils down to the whole concept of, you know, all renewable energy storage plant economics are local, right? And although curtailment is not a, a major piece of the income streams that drive um, this particular example project we're talking today, it, it's really fascinating to look at the differences in curtailment across ISOs in the United States, as well as one international market, China, where you know, they're building more wind and solar than anybody else in the world, almost everybody else in the world combined, right? And, you know, some of the things to kind of point out here is ERCOT, right? ERCOT had huge curtailment, you know, not, not too long ago, six, seven years ago. And then they put $7 billion into new transmission lines, right, into the um, CRES lines. And, you know, you see what happens to their uh, curtailment rates. MISO, MISO seeing 
uh, similar headaches. They look sort of like uh, ERCOT did in 2009. And it's going to be interesting to see what they do from a curtailment solutions perspective. Now, MISO is actually a bit of a head scratcher to me because the batteries could solve the curtailment issues, but MISO is really uh, trailing, you know, from a, a implementation of the uh, the FERC um, uh, NOPAR from last November. Their their markets do not enable large batteries to participate in these ancillary services yet, right? And all these numbers look pretty diminutive compared to the ones in China, and uh, you know they have significant uh, uh, power generation mix and transmission and distribution constraints in that market, and you know, uh, you hear people in MISO complain about 4 to 5 percent curtailment, and then you show them this chart, and they think, oh, wow, it could be a lot worse, right? So interesting regional differences. So we've talked a lot about um, how these utility-scale hybrid systems could work, and we did that sort of in a vacuum from which technology is the best. And, you know, the energy storage, utility-scale energy storage industry is really coming up the learning curve, right? There are um, uh, new demonstration projects being announced quite a bit, and, and frankly, the majority of them are lithium-ion in nature, right? And along comes vision, right? And we'd like to talk about, over the next 10 minutes, how we compare and why we're able to do this in a much more uh, profitable manner for, for farm owners and uh, why we have the uh, best technology. So if you're not familiar with Vision, right, we, we make a 20-year flow battery, right, that is uh, able to deliver multiple cycles a day with zero degradation. You can see that a one megawatt hour system can safely discharge for about three and a half hours at full power or up to 12 hours at one-third rated power. In the upper right-hand side, you're looking at like a 20 megawatt system, and a cross cut of that is on the lower left-hand side. You know, the the bottom uh, container is just tanks, right? It's um, uh, two large tanks. One is analyte, one is catholite, and then you have 12 stacks. Each stack is about 20 kilowatts, all right? So um, no, it's a it's a pretty uh, high commodity intensive uh, system in, in such that the Containers are commodities. The uh, tanks themselves are commodities. You fill the tanks up with analyte and catholite. That's basically water, KOH, zinc salts, um, and iron salts, you know, stuff that you can find um, in the right purities just about anywhere in the world at relatively low cost. Then you have standard PVC pumps, uh, piping and plumbing and pumps. It's just off-the-shelf type stuff, type stuff. And then the stacks themselves, right? And the stacks either um, plate zinc on iron to store electricity, or they deplate zinc from iron to release electricity. Now you can go a lot deeper into our technology 101 section and learn a lot more about the technology, but just at a high level, right? When you look at uh, utility scale grid storage, um, you know you're building wind farms with 20 plus year economic life. Right? So when you're looking at a system, it's really important to look at what's the economic life of the battery. So vision is 20, lithium ion is 10 or less. Uh, when we were looking at energy services and power services earlier and the different types of income stream classified by either E or P, it's important to understand, and we'll talk about this in a couple of slides, how lithium ion systems are either rated for energy services or for power services, whereas vision systems can deploy uh, power services and discharge for power services across the complete state of charge simultaneously while they're delivering energy services. And so that's the ability to really start to stack these revenues as opposed to having to pick power only or energy only. Safe, non-toxic, non-explosive chemistry, right? This is end of life. This is permitting. This is the fact that you're going on somebody's agricultural land or grazing land or on BLM land. You've got significant environmental exposures and vision systems, um, you know, are being built all around the world today and some of the most environmentally challenging places to per permit, like right along the Rhine River in Germany. Uh, capacity fade, right? You, you need to manage that uh, with a, um, a capacity.
capacity guarantee from your system integrator if you're using lithium ion, right? Because they fade three to five percent per year. If you have a cell phone, you know that's probably much faster than that, but that's the guarantee. And uh, I, whether through oversizing or capacity augmentation, you know, it, it gets pretty expensive, and it's important to, to look at those in terms of overall system cost and expected opex. I wrote, won't read every word on this, but you know, Vision is a 10-year-old company. 100% of everything we make is manufactured by Jabil. Uh, we've been reviewed extensively by many independent engineering companies, including Black and & Veatch, and they've published a big, long report that will put you to sleep that basically says the battery will last 20 years, and it does what we say it's going to do. And then this, right? And I, I think this is, if you don't take anything away from this today, uh, take away this slide, please, right? So this middle graph here, these two charts, energy and power, these are taken directly out of a lithium-ion supplier's brochure. So when you walk up to buy a lithium-ion system, you need to make the decision on day one whether you're going to use that system for things like uh, short-duration power services, things like uh, frequency regulation and voltage support, or if you're going to use that system for longer duration services like uh, uh, curtailment elimination, bulk energy shifting, transmission and distribution, uh, congestion relief, right? The, the whole laundry list of services that are available to a, uh, an IPP-based system in our original example, um, you, you really have to decide whether you're going to do one group of them or another group of them with lithium-ion versus with vision. You have the ability across the complete state of charge to drive power for 20 years with no fade, right? And so it's a, it's a really, really critical difference between uh, the two uh, solutions. And I'll bring us back actually to this slide, right? Where we have E is energy services, P is power services. Squint your eyes, okay? You can kind of see the blue P's and the red E's, right? That, that's what I'm asking you guys to choose between if you're gonna go with lithium ion. We're, we're watching a lot of lithium ion systems get built you know, and you'll see that they are being built with, you know, a very low DC ratio to the overall plant size on the wind farm. So you'll have like a 100 megawatt wind farm and a 2 megawatt battery. Those are typically demo systems being done with short duration lithium ion so that they can prove out the ancillary service revenue models, right, some of them. Um, and so those types of power applications, if you're going to do power only, frankly, use lithium ion. If you want a system that can deliver the value across the complete list of uh, revenue streams and value streams, then you need something that has the ability to um, be versatile. So a question we get all the time is, uh, well, then, Mike, why don't we just use two lithium-ion batteries, right? We'll use a big block, a DC block of the power ones. We'll use a big DC block of the energy one. And this is my answer right? Because with a vision system at $400 a kilowatt hour, you know, that's your expected uh, cost, right? And that includes a 20-year capacity guarantee. That's kind of part and parcel with our technology because there is no fade. When you start to look at lithium-ion hybrid systems uh, for power and energy, you start to see the need for a significant cost adder uh, for a second DC block, right? You have the power block and then the energy block. The balance of systems for lithium ion are higher than vision because lithium ion modules, right, they're about the size of a suitcase. They then need to be installed in racks. They need to be installed into uh, insulated containers. They need to be installed manually on site because they can't ship installed. And then they need HVAC, right? And the cost of integrating both the power and energy solution in a hybrid, frankly, it's never been done. Theoretically, it could be, but it's more complex. Right, the vision system, the 325 in our math is fully containerized, full of full of uh, electrolyte, ready to go, commissioned. Right, so there's not that significant additional cost uh, on top of the battery. And then there's the capacity guarantee, right, for 20 years. Uh, this is a number that uh, is evasive. Um, you know, you, you look at the uh, the forward cost of lithium-ion batteries, and if you say, okay, well, these things are going to these things are going to be roughly half of what they are today in year 11, then I'm going to need to swap them all out. I can't swap out a portion of them because there's mismatches and impedance. And, uh, you know, let's drop this in. 
Now, um, if you're looking at energy storage and you're talking to vendors, be sure that your RFP includes a 20-year capacity guarantee and get the price and get it in writing. My question is related to the power and uh, energy topic. So um, division systems have to be engineered to switch between power and energy services across the state of charge. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm sorry I didn't address it uh, as I've been talking. And the short answer is no, right? So vision systems can seamlessly in uh, below uh, 20 microseconds uh, shift from energy service to power service, anywhere from, you know, 97 down to 3% state of charge, right? They have the ability uh, to provide power services across the complete state of charge. Whereas with lithium ion batteries um, that are uh, formatted for power applications, you by warranty requirement can only do power applications between I think it is 40 and 65% state of charge. So we've been talking a lot today and this is sort of a, okay, let's come you know, two steps up above from uh, this topic. We've been talking a lot today about wind, right? And, uh, you know, utility scale wind, and I've shown this as a unique mix of energy services and power services. Um, you know, this is, I think, the, from, from we, we've seen 150 utility scale deals around the world over the past six months. And we are trying to understand the, the best way to maximize the value of a battery, any kind of battery. And what you're looking at here is the mix of services that are required to essentially um, meet the needs of that market. And you can see PJM frequency regulation. I've got it as PP because it used to be 15 minutes. Now it's moving to 30 and all the batteries that were built for 15 minutes are about to go belly up. Same thing with uh, utility scale solar. There are a bunch of energy services and power services. And, um, we could go into all of these, and on previous webinars I have, but uh, looking at across these types of systems, it's critical that you have a battery that can do multiple types of services from one platform. So when you're going into, and, and Matt, somebody asked this question earlier, when you're going in to select a site, you know, your environmental health and safety and permitting team are really going to have to uh, be careful with various types of battery chemistries, right? The vision system, however, is a 200. Right, that means it's uh, non-explosive, uh, non-toxic, non-corrosive, non and uh, it's relatively easy to permit and site. As I said earlier, we're placing batteries in some uh, pretty sensitive wetlands right now uh, in some uh, pretty aggressive countries when it comes to permitting and uh, overall um, site constraints. I think I'm getting towards the end. This is my last slide. I'm sure many of you are happy about that. But uh, um, so vision, right, whether you look at the, in our particular example in uh, Wyoming, at the other end of that transmission line, um, wheeling power through the WEC into Cal ISO, right, and um, uh, doing it through a new $3 billion transmission line, which is the first of many that I believe will be built over the next 10 to 20 years to get renewable energy to market. Um, we can save two cents per kilowatt at P50 levels, right, within the plant and actually have the battery be accretive to IRR, depending upon uh, how aggressive you are with various ancillary service estimates. In addition, we can save an extra cent per kilowatt hour on the transmission and distribution expenses because we're able to juice the amount of energy going into uh, the battery by up to 43%. We're currently building the largest flow batteries in North America, Central America, India, and Europe. Uh, it's a 20-year system, zero fade, super competitive, CapEx, OpEx, power energy services in one, and tier one partners around the world. So what that means is if you're an IPP or a utility and you have a project in Europe, Australia, Latin America, North America, Canada, and you want us to take a look at it, I'm sure the first thing that you're going to ask me is, what's the turnkey cost? 
Well, as you saw from my cost stack up, vision is anywhere from 65 to 80% of it. Uh, I can estimate the rest of it, but if you really want to move forward and move forward quickly, we have EPC partners and not small ones, big ones who are bonded and um, who you've probably worked with in those territories uh, who can bid these systems turnkey uh, in your market. So uh, with that, I think I'll uh, end it. It's been, what is it, uh, 46 glorious minutes, and I'll open it up uh, to Q&A. Great, Mike. We already have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, I'll ask specific ones as much as I can. Otherwise, we've had some similar ones, so some of them might have to be grouped together. And any we don't get to today during the session, um, we'll also try and uh, get back to you uh, individually. So one question that's been asked in a, a few different ways is um, what kind of uh, electrolyte maintenance is there? How often do you have to do it? Is there special gear or things along that line? Sure. Sure. So our uh, electrolyte is a 20-year electrolyte, um, so it, it never needs to be replaced. It does not wear out. There is an annual polishing, which is the moral equivalent of checking and adjusting the pH in your pool. Um, it's done by a non-chemist technician, somebody who's trained uh, to come out to site. That person is not wearing a bunny suit, you know, for hazmats. That person is uh, wearing um, a respirator some goggles, gloves up to the elbow, and, you know, they're extracting some chemistry out of either tank. They're doing some tests on the back of a pickup truck, and then they're balancing it, right, by adding, uh, you know, some uh, proprietary elements to it. And so that's the annual annual electrolyte maintenance. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question asking about either footprint or if uh, if business flow batteries take up more space than like a comparably sized lithium ion batteries. Ah, I love this question. It comes up every time, and so I've got my trusty rusty slide in the back here, right? And you know this is uh, an important way to look at it. So the answer is yes. Uh, vision systems take up more space than lithium ion, uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent more space, you know, overall footprint. Right? Lithium ion batteries, they're nice and compact because they were built for your phone or for your car. Um, and, uh, you know, when you start to look at adding on the HVAC equipment and adding on the offsets, things start to equal out. What do I mean by offsets? So on uh, at least four projects in the last six months, uh, we have received from either the utility or from the local permitting agent a, um, uh, an approval to go right up next to a substation, where in the same project, the lithium ion solution has had to have a 200 foot offset from the substation. So this type of high value grid infrastructure requires an offset for lithium ion because every fire department in this country has a fire response plan for just about every commercial industrial and utility scale facility, and that plan includes what to do if it starts to be actively engaged in a working job, a working fire. And um, the only response for a lithium ion fire is to let it burn and protect any high value um, um, pieces of property uh, that are nearby. So what will happen is if the lithium ion system starts to burn, then uh, the fire department will show up and they'll start uh, protecting the substation, whereas Vision could be right up next to it. And just in that area, including roads and access ways for the substation, Vision could put up to 65 megawatts around that substation. So, you know, even though we have a footprint penalty, which frankly on a wind farm, I haven't met a wind farm, um, and I've looked at hundreds, that has, uh, that'll have any issue with footprint. Um, sometimes solar farms are a little tight. Uh, obviously, industrial facilities are a little tighter, right? Uh, a lot tighter. Um, but when we start looking at these grid scale storage, you know, footprint really isn't the major concern. Okay, and a specific question um, about sizing for wind, wind farms. Uh, is there like a, a ratio that you go by for battery size to megawatt size of the, of the wind? Yeah, and so I'll, I'll jump around here, and you know I think maybe this is the this is the right way to look at it here. 
Um, and you know, the short answer is no. But if you sit down with my application engineering team and we look at your site and your state and the transmission line and the nodal pricing and the values for ancillary services at that point of interconnect um, and uh, uh, some of the other key drivers of these potential income streams, we can absolutely work with you to do a, uh, a goal seek around what is the ideal size of the storage to maximize, maximize plant uh, IRR and MPV. Uh, we have the tools in-house to do this. Um, we have the experts that we can either bring to bear or refer you to. Um, it is, uh, it, unfortunately, it varies by site, um, and it's, it's absolutely something that we can support. Okay, another, uh, another good question here, Mike. What's the round trip efficiency of Vision's batteries? Now, that's, that's a good question. And our, when, when we talk about round trip efficiency, it's important to talk about AC, AC round trip efficiency with auxiliary losses. And, um, you know, so AC, AC round trip efficiency means what is the round trip efficiency of a battery of a kilowatt hour going through the inverter? into the battery, out of the inverter, uh, and, and onto the point of interconnect. And then let's make sure that we're all honest about the HVAC and auxiliary losses of the project. Vision comes in all in right around 74%. And that's irrespective of um, the ambient temperature of the plant, right? And, you know, I'm going to jump back here to the Black and Veatch conclusions because um, I didn't read everyone when we went through the presentation, but you know, one of the most frustra frustrating pieces of specsmanship that I'm seeing um, in the market right now is the untruths being presented by lithium-ion battery manufacturers about expected round-trip efficiency. They're being defined uh, and being talked about, you know, in the uh, mid '80s to low '90s. Uh, they're not talking about ACAC. They're eliminating auxiliary losses because, as we know, there's 24-7 HVAC to keep the batteries within a tight temperature window. Uh, they're not talking about um, round-trip efficiency uh, under high power or low power. It's always nominal power. And we're not talking about round-trip efficiency outside of a certain state of charge, right? So there's all these caveats, all this fine print in a lithium-ion warranty around round-trip efficiency. Black and Veatch looked at this, and they came to the conclusion that vision batteries outperform systems with lithium-based chemistries at high ambient temperatures due to the fact that we require, it says smaller, but it's really no HVAC load. And so, um, you know, like, like I asked you to do earlier, if you're looking at a lithium-ion system, uh, I would require a 20-year capacity guarantee to be priced up front because it's like buying a, a car without wheels. And I would require to see an ACAC um, round trip efficiency guarantee inclusive of all auxiliary loads. Because I think for many sites, vision and lithium ion are competitive. Mike, we've had a few questions um, just asking how, how vision's chemistry uh, compares to other flow batteries like vanadium, and if you know a lot of vision benefits uh, are, are against lithium ion, also true for those. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, vanadium flow batteries have been around for a long time, and from a performance perspective, right, the ability to do power and energy, you know, some of the uh, new generation advanced vanadium batteries can do uh, the the same types of uh, power and energy. However, there are two key differences between lithium, I'm sorry, between vanadium systems and vision systems. The first is safety, the second is cost, right? So when we talk about safety, uh, we talk about a vision system which is based, has an electrolyte that's basically water, uh, KOH, and uh, zinc salts and iron salts. So it's slightly alkaline, right? It uh, basically at 200 has the same uh, NFPA rating as Purell, the stuff that you rub on your hands, 
right? So it's non-toxic, non-corrosive, uh, non-flammable. Uh, when you start to look at uh, vanadium-based systems, the, the major ingredient is, uh, I want to say, sulfuric acid. And then, you know, the vanadium pentoxide. So the sulfuric acid um, creates significant environmental health and safety concerns for, for vanadium-based batteries. And then the vanadium pentoxide is a well-known carcinogen, right? So uh, when you build a vision system and you permit a vision system, you know, the systems we're building, they don't require large concrete catch basins. They don't require large berms. They don't require all types of uh, protection equipment that vanadium redox battery systems do uh, to make sure that if there was a leak, if there was a spill, it didn't become an EHS issue, right? And so that's the safety concern. And then, you know, let's talk a little bit about cost, right? And so uh, where am I going to go here? Here. So we're talking about a battery, 2019, for a 30 megawatt system commission, DC block 325 a kilowatt hour. Right? We can do that. And when you look at our quote, you're going to see that our battery is broken out between the DC block and the chemistry. And our chemistry is priced between, uh, well, let's just say, $55 a kilowatt hour. And that's price. So there's margin there. Right? We're, we're going to try to make money as a business. Um, and our cost is less than that. And if you look at the cost of uh, vanadium-based chemistry, last I checked, it's north of $175 a kilowatt hour for the chemistry alone. So there's a 3x difference in cost of chemistry between Vision's alkaline system and the acidic uh, um, uh, VRB system. Uh, now, the systems perform well. They do power and energy, most of them. And uh, they should last 20 years. Right, uh, some of them, and so it is a uh, comparable performance, significant difference in environmental health and safety, and significant difference in cost. All right, we're pushing right up against time. I have uh, so I think we have time for one more question with a reasonably quick answer. Um, is there is there anything special about the about the tanks or where they can be located on a site? Now, uh, it, it's a good question, and uh, let me get to uh, the best picture we have here of the system, right? Um, the, the tanks themselves are uh, roto-molded polypropylene tanks, right? Um, they are manufactured in what we believe is the largest roto-molder uh, in the world, right? So they're like giant uh, milk bottles or huge, uh, huge kayaks, uh, you know, just big plastic tanks. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting, right? So this is engineered around the constraint of being inside a container, right? Um, and you know, the market has asked that our system be inside a container. Uh, now, I know of some pretty large engineering company right now that is looking at engine engineering the system in a building and sourcing tanks locally in various regions around the world, right? Because um, no use shipping air, right? If you're gonna uh, load these things up and, and fill them with electrolyte on site, right? And uh, there's some pretty novel approaches. Vision is flexible in terms of uh, the overall packaging and engineering of the solution. Um, there are many regions of the world where there are very large tanks that are commercially available for other industries which are perfectly suitable uh, to be used with vision systems. And, uh, you know, if, if your company is a, um, uh, a company with the uh, engineering resources to execute that, we'd be happy to support you. Great. Thanks, Mike. Any more, thanks, Matt? No, that, I think we're right on time. So that, that was a good answer, a good timing. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining today. Um, within a, a couple hours after the ending of the session, the recording will be going out to everybody that registered. So thanks again. Have a great day. Give us a shout if you need anything.